with the Treaty of Paris or the European Common Market. And many people, I believe, misunderstand what exactly has taken place, what the British people have said yes to, <coughs> and what they've never had an opportunity to determine. <coughs> First of all, the Treaty of Paris, as it been eloquently described, was to bring together the coal and steel communities of Europe in a rebuilding program. But you should look at the architects of the European common market and at the coal and steel community. They really are ultra left-wingers. <laughs> First of all, there was John Foster Dulles. John Foster Dulles was the Secretary of State. Same position that Hillary Clinton held during a turbulent period. <coughs> And the President of the United States, Truman, who wanted this European movement. And a man called Jean Monnet was the man who first advocated the iron and steel and coal community. I know about Monet. I had the fortune or misfortune <coughs> to sit on a commission that determined whether children in each of the European countries were entitled to educational grants under that treaty in the event that their father had been killed at work in the mining or the steel industry. To listen to some of those discussions would have raised the proverbial eyebrow. They were particularly the elite, the bureaucrats who said, you know, we don't believe that this is a, a proper case because she does not have all the academic qualifications. I thought if we're here all day, she will have before we go. <laughs> not once during my session over three years was any child turned down for a European grant, because they were entitled from their own government, <coughs> not from Europe, to have that grant. You will have heard in the press, television, all the media, how important it is to remain in the European Union. How many people have examined or been able to examine? Because you have been prevented from le learning the truth. And until, say, tonight, you won't have heard many of the things that have been said by the two of us. First of all, we were part of a European coal and steel community by a decision of Parliament. We didn't join the European common market, as many people think. The Parliament in Britain joined under Ted Heath's leadership in 1972. And it wasn't until 1975 that the British people were consulted as to whether or not we should remain in the European common market. It might surprise you to know that the British people have never joined the European Union. Oh, the government have because it's in their interests and it's in the interests of the free market and capitalism to be a member of this conglomerate which supports free enterprise and is opposed to the collectivization of working people. There are three fundamental questions that I will be addressing tonight. One is the economic argument. <coughs> I certainly am not going to, you know, duck it, like some who go on television have been ducking it. The ones who got the seven million grant to be able to put, rather badly in my view, a case against continued membership of the European Union. When Michael Gove was on television, he couldn't name an economist who supported 
leaving the European Union. I could have rattled ten off without batting an eyelid. It should strike someone with a little surprise that a man in his position, put in the case, couldn't even put an economic argument. Well, I only studied economics at the <coughs> University of Leeds. But my, my economics were already founded. I was taught by people like Harry Pollitt and Willie Gallagher. I was taught by the communists in the party that I was a member of. And I understood the need for the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. In other words, I believed in socialism. I did then, I have done since, and I still do, and I always will. It is a fundamental right to understand the requirements why we should have that economic fact spelled out. When you look at the nations in Europe, it's very interesting. You're told, and I've heard it said even by some who actually want to come out of the European Union, that yes, there is a market. And what will we do if we come out of this market? There are 500 million, 500 million people. And where are we going to go for our, our economic well-being? 500 million. <laughs> Do you know that in our trade with the European Union we're in debt? I don't just mean we're in debt because we pay a hell of a lot of money. We get nothing back from our membership fee. Don't be kidding about that one. It's a three cart trick. The late Paul Daniels would have had a field day with it. <laughs> what happens is this, when you look at the trade overall, 170 million I said, 170 billion we're in deficit with. I'll tell you what they do, shall I? They operate in a system that those countries that are behind the whole basis of the principle of the European Union are the ones who are going to manufacture goods and services. Look at the facts. In 1972, the year that we did join the European Union by a parliamentary decision. The population of Britain was 58 million and the birth rate of 1.8. And just in case there's somebody from the sun in here, I'll spell it out for them. A birth rate of 1.8 results in a decrease in the population as time goes by. Today as I'm speaking, we've now got 68 million and yet we haven't had any increase in real terms as far as the GDP of manufacturing is concerned. In 1972, 80% of our wealth was based on manufacturing, on coal, on steel, on shipbuilding, fisheries, farming, all the goods and services that Britain really needs. Money in itself is useless. Put yourself on a desert island with five pound notes or 20 or even the funny 50 pound notes. You won't get a drink from it and you won't be able to eat it. The real wealth is that which you manufacture. <coughs> Mahatma Gandhi said something that <coughs> resonates down the ages. We should have homespun. In other words, we should have our own industries, our own facilities, our own wealth. How many people know that in 1972 Britain produced 80% of its own food? Today it produces 59% of its own food. In 1972 we had a thriving coal mining industry that powered nearly 90% of our electricity. In 1972 we had a large shipbuilding industry a massive, well-stocked fishing industry. The farming industry, of course, was supported by government aid. Look what's happened. Today, there's no coal industry. They've wiped it out. Is it on the grounds of either economics or environment? 
No, it's a lie. Today, as I'm speaking, <coughs> we're importing 40 million tons of coal from outside the European Union on the grounds that it's economically viable. Well, I'll tell you this. If we've got to import coal produced by seven-year-old children or by slave labor, it's not bloody well for me. And the sooner we get out, the better. In addition, we've also got an important element, a really important element that we've got to deal with, and that's sovereignty. Sovereignty is not something that's a, a funny word. It means that you have to have the right to determine your own future. Who told me that? I read it. I read it by a Scotsman born <coughs> Irish parents, the legendary James Connolly. Connolly would have been utterly opposed to the European Union because he argued that a country could only be independent if that country had the right to be able to determine its own policies and make those it elects accountable to recall. Think about it. That brings me to Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish National Party. If you thought I were going to do that when you were wrong. 1975, they opposed the European Union. What's changed? Well, I heard Nicola, who I've got a lot of respect for. She was very eloquent on television. Certainly compared with that lot. And yet here she is arguing that Britain should remain in the European Union. Well, how the hell does she square wanting independence for Scotland in order that if you get independence for Scotland, she wants to give it away to an unelected bureaucrat in Brussels? It doesn't make sense. And of course, the third of them is probably the most important of the lot. And that's either immigration or migration. And it's no good ducking it. <coughs> Socialists have never ducked it. I recall in 1947-48, not because I was there, even though I am knocking on, <laughs> but the union leadership in Scotland <coughs> And in Wales, Northumberland, Cumberland, Yorkshire, every coalfield opposed a move within the European common market to close Italian pits and bring in Italian workers into the mining industry. They said what will happen is they will take the jobs that belong not to us but to our children. We hold them in right for their future. In other words, we hold them in trust. And you can't suddenly bring other people in to do those jobs as migrant labour. Don't mix it with immigrants. Britain has always and should always welcome people who are immigrants or asylum seekers or people who are desperate in a situation <laughs> which is no fault of their own. But there is a fundamental difference between immigration and asylum seekers on the one hand and migrant labour on the other. According to Angela Merkel and indeed every supporter of the European Union, the cornerstone of the European Union is the free movement of labour and capital. Always ignored by them. There's two four features. The movement on the one hand of labour and the movement of capital. Now I came up to Scotland at the invitation of Louise at a time when they had a large Volvo plant in her area. And they were going to close it. And Louise said like, with pressure on my arm, 
Will you come down and speak at the gates? And I agreed. And the workers came out. And I spoke to them. And I challenged, if you could hear me, the managing director to join us. By the way, Scottish television were there. Both sides. And this crackpot did. He came out. And I asked him a question. I said, is this plant, it was Volvo, is it profitable? He said, yes. I said, is the workforce good? He said, it's excellent. I said, well, why are you going to move the whole profitable plant across the sea to Poland? He says, because the wages in Poland for workers are five times less than they are in Scotland. That's what the European Union is about. <coughs> they can move it. In Ireland, I don't know how many people have actually handled a piece of it, but you'll have heard of it, Watford Crystal. There were, what was it, 10,000 workers there. I know Watford Crystal. I did a lecture in Waterford <coughs> in memory of a man who died in the Spanish Civil War. And one of the things that they did during the day was to take me around this wonderful glassworks, beautiful crystal. They closed it and took that entire Waterford crystal. I think it was to Czechoslovakia. They still call it Waterford crystal. All those workers lost their jobs. Doesn't matter to the European Union bureaucrats. What matters to them is the acquisition of profit, irrespective of the <laughs> devastation it causes to the communities. Not only that, of course, it gets far worse. In Britain, we no longer have any real manufacturing industry. We don't have a coal industry. We don't have a steel industry, except for a rump, and that's under threat. We don't have a shipbuilding industry, apart from a small bit. We don't have a fishery industry, because it's been annexed by the European Union. The farming industry has been sectionalised. Bearing in mind, he always got subsidies from the British government before we went in to the European Common Market or to the European Union. Yet, is there any need for it? <coughs> Just think about it. I've heard the people in the environmental movement say about coal. The reason we don't want coal is it's a pollutant. It produces CO2 in the atmosphere, all right? Well, what does 40 million tons of coal imported do? It must do the same thing. But there's a far better answer to it. I don't know how many people have heard of the Boundary Power Station. It's in Saskatchewan in Canada. And the Boundary Power Station has introduced technology called carbon capture with a fluidized bed and it's eliminated 90% of all CO2 making it the cleanest fuel that powers an electricity plant. So why aren't we using Scottish coal? Why aren't we employing Scottish miners, Welsh miners, Yorkshire <laughs> miners producing wealth? Don't forget, you know, it's not just power stations that coal can fire. It's an essential ingredient of cement mixing, of concrete. It's an essential feature of making nylon. It does 101 things. It even produces saccharin. So that you've got this wonderful technology. And yet here where it was developed, we've ignored it, we've scrapped it, and we're allowing Canada and America to develop it. In addition to that, look what's happened to the steel industry. I was called a liar in 1984 when I said that the government had got a pick closure program. It took 30 years and the production of the government papers under the 30 year rule to prove that they'd lied to the British people and not just to the miners. And in doing so, of course, they'd wrecked an the economy. What is the real unemployment figure in Britain? 
I heard the official figure from my colleague, and I understand the figure. But the real figure is the 11 million unemployed. Who says? The Guardian. Not exactly. On the left, it's not a socialist worker newspaper or a morning star. They say, when you take everybody into consideration who want a job and can't get one, there are 11 million people without a job. That's the price of being members of the EU. <coughs> In addition, <coughs> look at the figures, because the two tie together of immigration and migration. These are the official figures, and again, just in case that proverbial some reporters <laughs> popped in secretly, and definitely for the benefit of the CIA agent, there always is one. <laughs> These are the official figures of migrant labour in 2014 and 2015. Now I'm going to say it slowly, so I won't even misunderstand it and you won't. 2014, they say, from the Office of Statistics, 223,000 came into Britain. And in 2015, they admit that 257,000 came into Britain. My maths are not very good, but I've added that up, it comes to 480,000. But it's a lie. It's a lie. In the same two years, the state issued national insurance numbers in 2014 to 590,000 and in 2015 to 630,000. And I reckon that that's a total of 1,220,000 migrant neighbours who came into Britain. Now why are we being kidded with it? I'll tell you why. Because it's the cornerstone of what the European Union is all about. The free movement of labour and capital. So if you don't watch it, they'll not only move labour, but they'll move your industry, if there's any left. I heard an economist on television, I think from JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs, those socialists do. They said, if they vote in order to leave the European Union, we will move out of the city of London. As if that terrifies us. <laughs> Let the subs go out, <laughs> put them on a ship and sail them off. They produce nothing except profit for themselves. They bring about calamity. Ireland was mentioned. I've just come back. Sinn Féin changed their policy on the EU on the, on the eve of the election in Ireland from opposition to the EU to support for it. And I believe, and I know them quite well, they did it because they thought, they thought it would bring electoral success. The opposite happened. They lost two seats in the Republic and they lost two seats in the North of Ireland. Do you know who won them? anti-austerity, anti-European anti Union candidates because the people in Ireland are fed up to their back teeth with the austerity that they've had to face since they signed after the first ballot rejected membership of the EU a second ballot was forced upon them in the knowledge that they would be better off and since 2008 it's been a disaster in Ireland. You don't believe me? Anybody who's been or anybody who goes can see it all around you. There are houses boarded up. Three things have happened. Ever since there was a republic in Ireland, it was made clear that never again would their people suffer as they had under British rule, primarily English rule. Never again would we see people subjected to eviction from their homes and put onto the streets. Never would there be charges for water. And never 
Would they have council tax arrangements? Do you know why they've been introduced in 2011-12? Because the European Union told them they had to be. <coughs> and in this election, the anti-austerity parties have made clear that there'll be no government unless they reverse them. And at least there's been a temporary reverse on water charges. They've scrapped them. Not surprising because 65% didn't pay them, which is the greatest way of treating an unfair policy. And secondly, they are removed from the Constitution the issue of ev eviction. De Valera said, never again shall we witness someone being evicted because they can't pay. And we've got houses in Ireland boarded up and courts being flooded with applications from banks who want to take possession of them to either leave them empty or to give them a to cut down price to speculators. That's the price of the European Union. Following the election in Ireland, three days later, and I've got a copy of the Irish Times, the European Union said, we don't like what you're doing. We do not agree with you spending money on a national health scheme. Surprising, isn't it? Eh? We don't agree that you should be stopping the issue of, of water charges. We think you should carry on with them. And we certainly don't think that you should interfere with the law as far as evictions are concerned. So who's interfering? Who's saying yes and who's saying no? I'll tell you what it means for Scotland. You can't support the fishing industry. Not because you don't want to, but because the EU says you can't. You can't reintroduce a massive shipbuilding industry. Not because you don't want to, but because the EU says you can't. And in the steel industry, I think everybody's seen what can happen. They're talking about how many people will lose their jobs. Port Talbot and in the various other steelworks, like Raymond Sprague was raised to the ground seven years after the end of the miners' strike. <coughs> There's a letter of mine being published today in the Morning Star, and I've called it Pensions Robbery. <coughs> We've got an, Ab an MP in Aberavon, <coughs> can't remember his name, is it Kidd? <laughs> Junior. We've got trade unions like Community, Unite, GMB putting forward suggestions of how we can cut their pensions and if we cut their pensions then we can reduce the pension debt and it will get someone to buy it cheaply. What the hell are we playing at? Yeah. I've made clear in this article that all those unions, trustees and MPs should be saying one thing Tata, should pay and bloody tata, away you go. You've got 91 billion pound in assets. You can afford to pay 500 million that you owe and haven't paid. That's the way we should be tackling the issues facing us within the European community and the European Union. So where would we go as far as the market's concerned? If we lost the 500 million that operate within the EU, well, I've got a list here. We've got 53 countries within what's known as the Commonwealth. And that's got a population of 2.3 billion. Some poor countries like New Zealand, Australia, from where we had massive trade. You've got Malaysia. You've got India, Pakistan, South Africa. All there available to do trade with. We could do trade with Venezuela, with Cuba. In other words, we can spread our wings and bring in a massive input of wealth and sustainability here in Britain. Well, I saw an MP <coughs> writing the other day, and honestly, it was a cracker. He says, look at the benefits we've got from the EU. He says, we've got Equal pay. He's not on this earth, is he? 
<laughs> We've got equal pay. Women are still getting a third less than men for the same job. And they say that the European Union will protect them. It's a lie. And it should be exposed as a lie. He says that trade union rights will be protected. <laughs> and we're not able to strike. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what the trade union movement should do. And I've never said anything that I wouldn't do myself. They should say, stuff your legislation, stuff your European Union. If you're going to attack us, we're going to fight back. And that means coming out and striking if necessary. <laughs> Of course, he, uh, he goes further, he says, just look, look what they've given us. Well, look what they've given us. Mass unemployment, poverty, austerity. Look what's happened to those countries that we're not <coughs> prepared to join the EU. Like Norway. <coughs> now, Norway <coughs> are not in the EU, but they're in the economic community, tied to it economically. But they are not subject to all its laws. And the fundamental difference is that they've got the richest pension fund in the world. They've got enough money in their pension fund to guarantee all their citizens a pension for maybe 500 years. Because their husbandry has been applied in such a way that they're looking after people in the twilight of their lives. <laughs> You've got Switzerland. Switzerland aren't in the EU. Pretty rich nation. And they've got a quota about who can come in and who can't. And of course Iceland didn't join. And Iceland was subjected to the problems and difficulties of their bankers in 2008 have now recovered. But not because they've been in the EU. If they had been, they'd probably be wiped off the map. You know, of course, you've got Liechtenstein. That's not in the EU either. But has anybody ever left the EU? The answer is yes. <coughs> Greenland. Greenland was a member of the European Union because it was tied to Denmark. In the same way that countries like Grenada are tied to Britain. And they took them in. But the people of Greenland said, we know, we don't want it. And we demand a referendum to come out. They held a referendum. By 70% majority, they voted to leave the European Union. They were told it would be economic disaster. The Prime Minister of Greenland, speaking on BBC television, <coughs> it got on somehow, he said, since we left the EU, our economy has grown and we are now richer than we've ever been. And by the way, our biggest customer are countries from within the European Union. In other words, the scare <coughs> is exactly that. They're trying to scare you by jumping into the unknown. They're trying to tell you it would take us years to get out of the EU. It's a nonsense. On the 24th, if we vote yeah, uh, no to the EU, we come out. We get back into the world. We don't go with their timetable. We go with ours. And there's no reason on earth why we can't do it. But if we've got the kind of laws and legislations that have been imposed upon this nation and upon your nation in Scotland, it means that we are subjugated forever under the rule of unelected and unaccountable bureaucrats. The only way you can ever change anything inside the EU is with a two-third majority. And that can only be attained by the six most powerful countries all voting together, including Germany. And they're not going to have it at any cost. I'm going to finish on these economic factors. Just think how many motor cars, I'm talking about mass production we produce in Britain, I'm talking about British cars. <coughs> we don't. We've got Japanese cars we produce, but we don't any longer have British cars. In Germany, they've got Volkswagen, they've got Mercedes, they've got all the other brands that they sell all over the world. In France, they've got Renault,
they've got other brands, at least three others. In Spain, they've got SIA, other brands, all auto, automotive. In Britain, haven't got one. In the steel industry, <coughs> Germany's got a thriving steel industry. Other countries, their steel industries have been wiped out. Coal industries, every single nation in Europe, apart from Germany, <coughs> has lost their coal industry. I don't know how many people know that Ireland had 12 coal mines, all closed because of their membership of the EU. They couldn't compete. Italy's gone. France's gone. Spain's gone. All the way through. And they're all now dependent on sources of energy from abroad, outside the community. And so on the three fundamental issues, one, the economics, where we would be far better off out of the EU and back into the world. Two, on the issue of sovereignty, we take back into our own hands the right to determine our future, elect who we want, not what they want. And any laws that are passed are passed with approval from us and can be recalled if we so desire. And finally, on the issue of immigration and migration, my immigration, they're welcome. Asylum seekers, they're welcome. Always have been. And when we had it before membership of the EU, we had a declining population. As a result of migrant labour, we've got a soaring population and we've got a budget with no manufacturing base which cannot sustain it. The sooner we begin to realise the economic social and political facts of life, the better for us all. I implore you, as I have done since 1960, to get out of this European Union monolith, <coughs> get back to that self-determination and back into the world. I argue that that is a socialist policy <coughs> and it's the one that opposes the fundamental principle of capitalism. Discussions with people about, about the whole question of the EU. One of the central questions that come is coming up and is starting to drive the whole campaign is the question of immigration. 
migration, asylum seekers and refugees. And it's a campaign that has been largely driven by the right as a way of scapegoating uh, working people uh, across Europe, across the world, uh, people fleeing war, <coughs> poverty, uh, oppression. And it's an agenda that the media has allowed them to dominate. But when you actually get out into the meetings, you find a completely different attitude towards the whole thing. Uh, you find people who welcome refugees and migrants and immigrants. And one of the things that we say in these meetings is we make no distinction between migrants and immigrants and refugees because that is part of the racist agenda moving for, for being pushed by Gove and people like that. And I'm sorry, after I, mean, I admired the stand that we took during the minor strike, admired the, the, the kind of way that you fought for working class rights, but in any way to concede to that filthy racist nationalism that's coming out of, 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 of the, the right, I think is a huge, huge mistake. It's not how uh, a lot of ordinary people feel about it. I mean, my own uh, family will almost not vote, will not vote for out because of the way this campaign, you will not put themselves in a position where they line up with, uh, with Gove and the rest of them. Now I think, look, I don't agree with them. I think we can put a positive argument, I think we can put a, a, an argument for a social Europe in which everybody lives together. Migration and immigration have been part of the development of this country. And I'm, I'm sorry, I think it's the completely wrong thing to, to go down. We attack it, we don't in any way echo it. Sorry. Can I answer that? No. Uh, let, what we'll do, right, yeah. I'm just, I know, I know, right, because I think Bob's picked up the wrong side of the stick here, but we'll just let it, we'll let Arthur and Vince answer, right, we'll take another question, yeah. Just a wee kind of quickie there, for the goal of the Tory party, I expect the kind of stuff they come away with, the kind of nonsense that they talk. But the sad bit to say to you, when you hear Barafakis and Owen Jones are actually doing the kind of, you've got 180 degrees, I sometimes go to shake my head and then suddenly I'm no surprise again. But the big trick, by the way, that I just picked a wee bit neither, I've not picked up properly yet, but it seems the great and the good, even including the Labour Party, <coughs> even including maybe new Barafakis and maybe even Owen Jones, <coughs> I'm not going to accept actually that if we do vote to come out, they still want to stay in the free market. This beggars the big question. What can a free market be talking about? And whose interest is a free market that they're talking about work for? I think we know. But I think actually that we should be on the left identifying the type of free market these people are talking about. It's not about the workers' rights, we know that. So this, this seems to be the thing that's coming now. So keep your eye on that, people, and I encourage you to do that. Even if we do win this, they still want it because part is free market and all that goes along with it. The free market that all but destroyed Greece, of course, is destroying yeah, the whole yeah. of Europe. Thanks, Arthur. I'll answer these three questions as briefly as I possibly can. First of all, I agree completely with the point that was made <coughs> about the SNP, and I understand. And you'll note that during my speech, I made clear that I respected Nicola Sturgeon, I admired what she <coughs> was saying during the debates, that it made sense. But quite frankly, it doesn't make sense uh, at all to argue on the one hand for independence only to give it away to an unelected, unaccountable body of people. But you know, there are differences within organizations who are supporting, for example, the Remain camp. Take for instance the Green Party. You've got an organization within the Green Party called Greens against the EU. And I've spoken on two platforms with them. And they're arguing against it because they understand fundamentally it means a free market. And a free market equals the people of Britain being further penalised. <coughs> Secondly, <coughs> you raised three important points. That last question, I'll deal with the final question over there, uh, last of all. You talk about uh, Varifakis. <coughs> former member of the Communist Party in Britain, as you probably know. Before he went uh, back to uh, 
uh, uh, Greeks, is wrong. His economics are out of kilter. It doesn't make sense. When he was negotiating on behalf of Greece, they got a deal presented to them, taking or leaving. They went back to the people in Greece, and the people in Greece said, we won't accept it, we support you, go tell them. The answer is no. What they should have done is to say we're going out of the European Union. Had they done that, Greece would no longer be in the clutches of the Goldman Sachs and the AP Morgans and all the financial institutions. And so it is definitely wrong as far as his economic policy is concerned. Owen Jones, I know him very well. I know where he comes from in Yorkshire. I've also spoken on platforms with him. He couldn't be more wrong. But you see, he's echoing the same message that tragically, tragically, Jeremy Corbyn is echoing. Jeremy Corbyn, who has been a long-time friend of mine, 25 years, who fought alongside Tony Benn and me, arguing the very arguments I've put tonight, including against migrant labour. Now, they're all in favour of remaining in the European Union. Why? Because of the pressure from ultra-right-wing <coughs> members of the Labour Party in Parliament. <coughs> but he's already got a mandate from those who elected him, not just to support his leadership, but to support the policies he put before them. One of which was to scrap Trident. <coughs> the second of which was to ensure that we came out of the European Union. And the third of which was to re restore Clause 4 of the party's constitution. All three of those major <coughs> fundamental questions have now been ditched by Jeremy Corbyn. And I thought I would never see the day when I had to disagree fundamentally and, and condemn Corbyn for what he's done and what he's doing. He's misleading the British people in a way that I didn't think would be possible. And quite honestly, I say this, if Tony Benn had still been here, he would have been appalled to see the change that's taken place. The second question, of course, is a fundamental one. I've heard it uh, only from one sector inside the movement. It's from the SWP, and I don't know if you're in the SWP or not. I suspect you are, yeah. The SWP have always had this, you know, let everybody come. It's a policy that doesn't really make sense. Bernie Sanders is fighting an election in America. He probably isn't going to win the delegates because of a rigged system. But he's not afraid of putting forward policies that on the face of them challenge the existing ethos. One of which is that you can't have unrestricted flow of migrant labour. And I stress it's migrant labour. I'm not talking about immigrants. I'm not talking about refugees. I'm not talking about asylum seekers. Of course we do. In our manifesto, by the way, which we published last year, we spell it out. I'll tell you the figures. The number of immigrants and asylum seekers coming into Britain in 2014 and 15 was approximately 250,000. And the figures I read tonight from, from the Daily Telegraph prove the point. In those two years, it was 480,000 migrants, not immigrants, but 250,000 immigrants and asylum seekers came in. Do you know how many people emigrated? I'll tell you, 357,000, which means that 157,000 go out. That's 100,000 in my rough calculation, more going out than coming in. So we ought to be able to take all those people who are genuine in their need and in their grief at the moment. But we cannot accept the free flow of migrant labor. It doesn't make sense. I'll give you an, an economic argument for it. If you have a budget that says we will have the amount of finance necessary to support 60 million people. That was our 
in round figures population in 72, or even in 82, we got a population of around 61 million. How can that same budget, even with an RPI increase, retail price index increase, how can that same budget take on board a further 10 million <coughs> migrant labour who are moving into this country, not because they're being persecuted. They're, com they're, coming, they're coming in because they want to come into Britain. Now, the question is, and you ought to be able to look at it carefully, television are playing their role in really trying to brainwash people. They've done a good job on some people. Think about it. They're picturing people coming in in camps in Hungary, in camps in Czechoslovakia, in camps in different countries. Now, I know, I don't, I, I'm sure that most people in this room know that under the United Nations and under the European Union, ironically, someone who comes from one country into another and claims that they are looking for status of citizenship have got to stay in that country. But they, they don't say that. They say, no, we want to go to Germany. Or we want to go to the United Kingdom. They want to pick where they're going. Now, I'm sorry, I disagree with that. I don't accept that we could suddenly have two or three million people walking in. Don't tell me I'm talking poppycock. If Turkey, who don't need to join the European Union, and I'm sure my colleague will agree with me, just like Switzerland and Norway, they could become part of the economic community and it means they've got to accept the free movement of labour and capital. And what happens if Turkey comes in with a population of 70 to 80 million and 2 million come in and walk into this country? change anything practically. But the one thing that's not changeable is the issue of free movement of labour and capital. And I'll tell you this, I don't <laughs> care who I disagree with. I'll fight that to the day I die, because I know it's wrong.